you ever thought about quitting music? Um. Uh, that's a great question. There's no sugarcoating it. Independent music is hard. Making a living as an independent musician is even harder. Shit, it's nearly impossible, to be honest. But even though it's a grind, there's thousands of musicians out there trying to make a living at different stages in their careers, and they all want you to listen, and maybe buy their shit. Tour fit. A tour ripped. Tour ripped. <laughs> this is the best part. This is why we do it. A lot of people join bands and they think it's exciting. It's a lot of uh, setting up your own garage sale every day. Yeah. I'm making a little email address list. It just says Boise. Well, tonight we're doing kind of, we're, we're playing like kind of a secret DIY space show, kind of invite only thing. And it's a fundraiser for Boise Mutually. And then some of the money will go to us because we're the only touring band. It's going to be the Papas, the French Tips, us, and then. Uh, built to spill. <laughs> we'll close it out. This is cool. Cool spot. Guess you're taking up all the merch space. Oh, oh no, we're we gonna are. we're gonna not take it all up. Don't worry, Jeremy. I was gonna ask you where should we park the van? Just oh. that bigger. You know, normally I'd say seconds. you're fine back there, but I don't know if you saw. There's a couple of big old vehicles kind of parked in there. Maybe until everybody's loaded up, get on one of the side streets That's okay. here. Uh, okay, yep. a side street? Yep. You got it, buddy. This is our van, also AKA Van 5000. She's treated us well. We try to keep her well oiled and she has not broken down on us except for like yesterday. It's mostly oil and like the battery. We live in New Mexico, but we toured through Phoenix and LA and uh, up California. Portland. Um, we right. spoke here. Yeah. So we drove through the mountains yesterday. It was like little Bavaria. Are oh. you headed anywhere after this? Yeah, we're gonna go home through Fort Collins and Denver. It's been great wow. and also very stressful <laughs> at the same time. CRLB, come on in. My name is Bill Waters. Uh, I'm working on this documentary about working class musicians. I'm running sound for the doc. Is it alright if I'm in frame? This is what it's actually like. <laughs> I'm also playing this festival. Played yesterday, playing tonight, playing on Saturday. I feel bad for the people in these hotel rooms that like didn't sign up for this. What are you guys doing up there on the balcony? Yeah? yeah? Cool. If you got any requests, just yell them down and I'll ignore them. <laughs> I think it's dope to work and play here at the same time because I can afford to be here and that's huge. So I'm not losing money, it's great. You play with the band a lot. Why aren't you playing with the band here? Because uh, they both have jobs. That's why. I think that like most working class musicians that like have jobs and play music are very familiar with that switch, you know? Because, like, when we're, like, filming the documentary and, like, we're working, I'm not in, like, art mode, you know? I'm in, like, work mode. I think a big part of, like, working in a crew like this or, like, yeah, comparison to, like, being in a band and touring like that is that, like, you got to be with this small group of people for, like, 10 hours a day. 
So it's important that you like them and get along with them. And it's important that like nobody's a dick too. And yeah, super important. That's almost more important than can you play. Yeah. It's like, will we get along with each other sitting in a van for seven weeks at a time? And who the hell are these guys? And why are we shooting them like this? Well, that's Magic Sword. They don't show their faces. It's an anonymous band. I had been around the music scene here for a long time, and with that becomes a preconceived notion of what you do as an artist. I didn't want anybody to know who this was coming from so that their judgment would be purely based on the product itself and not who I was as a person. When it first started, we kind of got together with this comic book artist to kind of devise this whole story and whatnot. So they kind of came up in the, the story first, and then we kind of had to figure out how to make them, you know, realize in real life. Do you guys have other jobs, or is this it? This is it. This I mean, is yeah. yeah, this is I'm it. a full-time musician, have been, we've been, you know, between the work that we do together and some work outside of it. How's it been doing with the trailer? Yeah. I drove it yesterday. How are you feeling with it? It's fine. Cool. Yeah. I'm not going with the trailer like driving in the scene and like parking. We're pretty DIY and I kind of like to keep it that way. Like we do all our own lighting and. Which is like, we just do everything ourselves. We're I mean, super self contained. Everything from like, the ground up, you know. We don't like to like hire out for stuff because, you know, we want to keep costs down into when we control freak. <laughs> yeah, the person that we bring with us on tour is the tour manager. What's this gonna look like? Are we setting we're setting up lights and then leaving lights set up? Oh, just next door. We're gonna just bring in the lights and then once that done, we can set your triangle where it needs to be and then this right there. And we can slide the triangle. We're waiting. We, yeah, we, we basically have to get the, those lights in first. I'm here to load in, if that's okay. Load in? Yes. Very good then. You're going on 540? 540, yeah. Might try to like run around Treeport a little bit before then and um, a little bit after, and then going to bed at like 10 p.m. because I fly to Philadelphia tomorrow. So the event manager's right there. Okay. And just tell him who you are and what band you're in. Good. This like punk band, I'm playing with. We're playing at Cheeky Knees in Atlanta. Um, so I'm excited. Yeah, grab your I've been fortunate enough to be at a place in at least my touring career where you're playing, you know, 500 to 3,000 cap rooms. There is a lot of respect for artists and kind of our needs and, you know, wants. But I know that, you know, when I'm touring on my own, it's probably not going to be the same. Um, so just trying to like keep all of those things in mind. Um, I got like an Instagram story, you know, on this day thing, you know those, from 2019. And I was playing in New York and it was like an empty room, <laughs> except for like my friend who was also playing. And I was like, God damn, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? Um, so it's really affirming to like be here in front of so many people in Boise, Idaho right now. of the like rat race and the competitiveness of the East Coast and didn't really ever feel quite at home there. And the I'm coming off of like a two month tour with Squirrel Flower and this is my off week here at Tree Fort. Starting April 1st, I'm back out for another two months with Pink Shift opening for Pop. So it's been like a crazy, I feel like I'm in like purgatory, tour purgatory. Do you like touring? Do I like touring? That's a good question. Um, I think I love it. 
I love, I love, I love people. Yeah. Love people. I don't love music. I love people. I could record John talking to somebody else forever. I love hearing John talk to people. He's good at it. Yeah, um, came out here um, with no plan. Um, I definitely wrote in my diary, like I think on the plane or the day before, like I do not know like why I'm coming out. I just took out a loan for $5,000. Um, I guess I signed myself and I paid like a thousand dollars to uh, take to get on this plane and uh, come hang out for the week. No, I wasn't scheduled to play at all. Um, I just came and was determined to uh, to play and to meet people and do everything I needed to do, everything that I would have somebody else do that I kind of have to do and want to do and get to do. So you came here with no plans, but you wound up at a pay session. Yeah. How did, that, how did that go? The pay selection was outstanding. Yeah, we just showed up. Uh, I had a guitar on my back and a bag of merch. And I, I walked in and shook everyone's hand. And... So you just walked into the pay session and said, can I play? Precisely. That's very yeah. admirable. And yeah. that's sick. That, well, there's only one way to do it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Pace Studio on the Road. We're live at the Tree Fort Music Fest with John Roseboro. John, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, my goodness. Oh, stop. <laughs> yeah, man, it's a total pleasure to have, have met you last night, and now here we are sharing your music with our audience. So thank you very much for yeah. doing it. You'll need to work. You need to be clever and creative and um, have fun. And I hope that something other than just the love of music keeps you to it. Um, for better, for good. After the first day, I was like, this is worth it, and I'm really happy. I just believe that I can do it. Thank you. It's me against the air conditioner, huh? <laughs> Fight that espresso machine, huh? Hey, get in here. What are you doing? Come on. Is everyone doing, doing alright? <laughs> like a death threat to their chest. I'll be on my way so soon. I'm blue collar as hell. I got a, a bunch of white trash running through my veins. My parents don't have money. Uh, my parents are broke. Uh, I have like a little bit of money. I can pay rent. That's because I work though. If I was just a musician, I'd have no fucking money. Okay, so at this point, you've seen some of the different levels these artists are at and whether they're secretly slipping EPs onto record store shelves or filling a room with sword waving maniacs, it's pretty clear that today, right now, they're hustling hard as hell. And believe it or not, almost 40 years ago, in the days of cassettes, zines, and MTV, the song remained the same. This is the first time the local news media have taken a close look at Boise's punk culture. They're called punks. And depending on who you ask, there are between a couple dozen and several hundred of them in Boise. One thing is certain, though. They have created a world of their own here. Once a month or so at this American Legion Hall in West Boise, some punk bands get together with a couple hundred people. It's called a gig. Um, Boise was pretty cool. So I grew up in Twin Falls, and there wasn't much 
you know, there was very few weirdos there. Well, first of all, I moved to Boise and I didn't know anyone. And it was about a month before school started and I was really alone. And I took advantage of that time to actually learn how to play the guitar. And punk rock and all these bands just playing simple things and making it sound cool. And you could pick it up and play it and you sounded like the band. Huge part of why I stuck with it and thought that what I was doing was any good. You don't really need to be afraid of these youngsters, you know, that they're really nice kids and all they want to do is just kind of be and grow up. Whether you like them or not, sociologists say the punks are going to stay around for a while. For many, it is a passing fad. But for others, it will remain a way of life in Boise, at least for the next few years. Dimitri and right now we have a band that went out for the indie door. They're called Built to Spill. They've been on a bunch of different indie labels, but right now they're on Warner Brothers. The front man for this band, Doug Marsh, basically was Built to Spill. He had like a rotating lineup, but he settled on a, a band that he likes to work with. He's uh, originally from Boise, Idaho. Little fact for you to put in your useless fact file. Keep it like a secret is the new album from my next guest. Please welcome all the way from Boise, Idaho, Built to Spill. <laughs> Bob Odenkirk here, 1995. I'm in Paris. At the time, it was the Foo Fighters as headliners and Built to Spill opening for them. Lots of intense feeling in their songs, lots of uh, mucky emotion, challenging situations. I love that, I love that in a pop song. So, Built to Spill is one of my favorites, always has been. Built to Spill is the band that I listened to every single day in the fall of 94 when I worked at Easy Street Records in West Seattle. I love Built to Spill. I love that song, You Were Right. It's genius and funny. You were right when you said all we are is dust in the wind. Built to Spill epitomized Boise. It's really hard to separate the two. Like, there's a song, Kicked It in the Sun, where Doug name drops Boise streets. The lyrics that begin the song are just about hanging out in Boise. There's a feeling from Ada to Irene. Those are a couple of streets in my neighborhood. Just living in Boise and staying up late at night, writing songs. That's kind of what the beginning of the song reminds me of. When it came to music, many people only knew Boise through Built to Spill, but there were hundreds of underground acts bubbling up. One of those bands was Finn Riggins. Hey, D Sandwich back here with LeGrand Life, and we've got a special treat for you today. Finn Riggins, the band, Cameron, Eric, and Lisa. I was learning a lot of music and uh, eventually starting a, a, several bands, but eventually this band called Finn Riggins with my wife, Lisa Simpson, and a good friend of ours, Cam Buyas. And we just were committed to just touring. We just wanted to, we, we were like, okay, let's just figure this out on our own. I just started booking shows in random places and we just practiced every day and we were just touring the country. We didn't have any fans, but we were touring the country just because it's what we wanted to do. And we, we, our perspective on it was kind of old school folk tradition of just going out and traveling the country, sleeping on floors, getting to know folks. Finn Riggins certainly has spent plenty of nights in this, their second home. They have put more than 200,000 miles on this car in less than five years, playing a gig more than 200 nights a year. We are fully entrenched in the music scene, not only like in our community, but like, you know, national touring acts, like we've met international bands, like people come and stay at our house, you know, we're not, like these are our friends, these are our community, like I'm a musician, this is what we do. In 2010, we, we just were literally on the road almost the whole year, um, and then, you know, we were getting to a point where we wanted to slow down a little bit, so then I was back in Boise, and 
basically had slept on a lot of floors and basically felt like karmically owed the rest of the national mm-hmm. DIY scene a lot of uh, floor space, but also helping with shows here in Boise. So I just started helping all our touring friends set up shows. And in 2010, we played South by Southwest for the first time. Um, and we were the only Idaho band there. So I got really passionate about how can we get more attention to Idaho bands? I think for my band's point, I was just part of a cool community of touring acts. And we were, we, we actually like, there used to be this thing called Ranch Fest. We'd invite all our touring friends out. And it was literally just a DIY barn fest. And we would make pancakes every morning for everybody that came. It was a donation based thing. All you can drink beer. And we'd make coffee. And it's just like how that started amplifying the community of bands that was living here and stuff. Just like we just realized that we needed to hang out more. Yeah. In 2011, um, good friends of ours, Delicate Steve, that we had met out east, they were coming this direction post South by Southwest, and they asked me to set up a show. Finn Riggins was going to play. There's a couple other local bands. So I decided to call it a post South by Southwest mini fest and just kind of promoted it that, that way. And then all of a sudden, like, all the local press started calling, and a bunch of bands started asking, you know, and through that, I just recognized, like, especially being out here in the Northwest, just the touring channels, there's just very few places for, for people to go. At the time, a ton of bands were coming from the West Coast and going to Austin and then all t- struggling to figure out how to tour home. And so I just recognized there's this need for a soft landing for the touring traffic. They were all heading back west. And it just so happened that some others in the community felt the same way. Laura, your background is not in music. No. Where does your passion come from? Because Eric is a musician, <laughs> you're a CPA. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was at a, a time in my life where um, you know, things were, had changed suddenly and were still changing. I met Lori Shandro and Drew LaRona. They had been trying to figure out how to potentially open a new music venue in the town. And Lori had some money set aside from um, her husband passing away and wanted to do something meaningful with that. My husband was one of those people that taught me to not be afraid of things. And um, I will forever be grateful to him for that. And I, we lived a very wonderful, normal Boise life for 10 years and then something horrible happened. And um, I went back to something that I was passionate about. I hid in music. And around that time too, well, I actually met Megan Stahl. She seemed to be professionally going to concerts at the time. And um, I knew she had been in marketing. So I, was, I just asked her if she wanted to join us. So she was kind of the fourth piece to that initial puzzle. How was the three four for you? Fuck yeah, three four. Several people recommended that we meet Eric. He had a plan, an idea to just see if we could get a lot of the bands routing up here from South by Southwest after South by Southwest. It was a cool scene here, really creative, like uh, art for art's sake scene happening here that just didn't have a good export system and didn't have a way for people to be to be seen here, seen and heard here without moving. One of our co-founders, Drew Lorona, and I were lamenting the fact that a lot of the independent bands, emerging artists that we wanted to see made drive through Boise and they like Boise, but they didn't ever stop and play here. I moved here in like 2009 and Boise at the time was like a stopover city. Bands would just like come and like have a day off. They would just stop in Boise and just hang out. And I'm like, well, why aren't they playing shows? We're the most isolated metropolitan area in the lower 48 states. The closest city is Salt Lake, which is like five hours away. So it's really in a weird spot. Boise. Boise? Boise. To Boise. Boise State for the win. They hand it off to Johnson. Boise State has won the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. But yeah, when I used to go out of town, like travel, whatever, people would be like, oh yeah, blue turf. Home of America's very first blue football field. Did you say Boise, Idaho? Boise! I remember it's worrying and being like, oh, I'm from Boise, and people being like, oh, 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 oh it sucks. Like, <laughs> must, that must be so lame. What do you say, Dad? Let's leave to Boise. Oh, if that's what you want, my children, then that's what you'll get. Boise, Idaho, get ready. We have a pretty, you know, tight connection with Boise from coming here over the years. I remember coming out and playing Boise before the festival was here and just like not even seeing anybody walking around on the street, you know, so different. The foundation of the festival for me is is literally like basically instead of just inviting one touring band to town, inviting 
a lot of turning pans in town at the same time. But how could a tiny upstart festival get anyone to notice it, let alone drive all the way out to Boise to play it? They would need some help, and that help came from a familiar face. Welcome to South by Southwest. Obviously, this is not your first time. Um, what made you decide to, you know, come and do it up again this year? Uh, my friend Eric Gilbert from Finn Riggins in Boise wanted to put together a Boise showcase. It sounded like fun to hang out with our friends from Boise and see all them play. So Doug was the first person I called. My band Finn Riggins had been touring with them in 2010-11. And he was the first person I called when we wanted to start the festival. He was very excited about it. He was an easy yes. And I think it's because he knew he trusted me and he trusted what we were doing. And he kind of wanted something cool around here too. But the fact that all my calls after that started with Built the Spills playing was a way easier way to op open the door up to other talent. And especially that it was gonna be on their home turf in Boise. Built the Spill has been this incredible crutch of ours too. Like not in a bad way, in a very good way. Like they have helped us, Tree Fort, as a festival, like really grow and um, get on the map. I really appreciate the support of Built to Spill they have always been from the beginning so supportive of this festival and loving this community. Turns out that same DIY ethos that was foundational for Built to Spill's beginnings was still strong in Boise, but this time it looked a little bit different. Gilbert was really the only one who had like done a festival like from the side of like participating in one. I mean, other than well, being a fan. And so the rest of us, we just kind of had no idea. I got a job as an accountant out of college because I felt like no matter what I wanted to do in my life, I needed to earn a living and there's no real way that I was a creative person that could pursue something that was big and beyond. The rest of the team was all people that had never really done events or festivals. And I think that's one thing that's made Tree Fort special. It's been built by a people that weren't already professionally doing it and kind of, we built it from just like our own lens. It was so punk. <laughs> I honestly, I had no clue what I was doing. I came from corporate marketing and I had no clue. I just followed Gilbert around the whole time. Yeah, I actually look at this as, it's kind of, as it, yeah, the spirit of, start, of starting a band. And, and I'll say that in the sense that I always have thought it's more important to have people you can get along with and are willing to try and are willing to improvise and roll with the punches. And if you have that, you can kind of do anything. My friends uh, in, in Boise, people were putting on punk rock shows and uh, I learned that you could uh, make music, even though you weren't a great singer or guitar player or had uh, connections or on a label or anything, you could still do that stuff and make music that was as good as what the pros were doing. It doesn't matter if you've done it before. Like if you're willing to try and figure it out, sometimes you're gonna end up with something something cooler than if someone has done it before, so. That's the only reason I'm doing this at all is because I was shown by some other people that you can do it even if you have uh, a limited amount of talent. If you have enough other ideas or creative in other ways, you can, you can make music that people want to listen to. So together with some others in the local music community, they started to develop ideas for a music festival. They would call it Tree Fort. Just back from South by Southwest, Boise band Finn Riggins kicked off the Tree Fort Music Festival to a packed crowd at the Neurolux. I'm really looking forward to Boise bands getting publicity, um, and I'm also looking forward to like the big names coming, you know, like up Montreal and uh, Built to Spill. They're like the band that uh, everyone associates with Idaho, probably. And he's just super generous to the local community of bands in particular. He takes a lot of bands on tour and stuff. and. He's very supportive in his own way. He's got his own way about it. You know, I have my own ideas about what I'm doing, and mm -hmm. I just kind of stick to that. And if someone understands it, great. If they don't, that's fine, too. Right. I don't expect anyone to. When I started the band, my idea was get a new group of people together, but keep the name and keep, you know, keep the discography and stuff. We've got Mel, Teresa, and Doug, the consistent member over the years. Let's start things first with the other two members of the band. Mel, which band do you play with? I'm in a band called Blood Lemon. 
And from Boise, Idaho as well. You're in. I'm in Built to Spill as well. Bragger. Okay. I love it. Super lightweight. They use like Neo Divian speakers. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll be like right here. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to kick off the main stage today with um, three of the most badass musicians in all of Boise. Legendary. And one of my co founders. <laughs> this next song we're going to play for you guys. It's called Leave the Gaslight On, and it's dedicated to our fucked up legislature in Idaho. I mean, we're basically like writing songs about what's happening in our lives as women and, and politics is a part of everybody's life, so not something we're shying away from at all. We were commenting amongst the three of us, like, to see a bunch of young women out there, like, singing our lyrics that we don't know was really amazing. We got to play next to, you know, on the lineup, next to Guided by Voices and the OCs, and it was insane. So we're super great. grateful. And Teresa, which is, uh, which is your band? Um, I play with a band called Prism Bitch out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yeah. Prison Bitch. <laughs> Prism. I want to meet y'all. Pri- no, no, Pri- Prism. Prism. Prism Bitch. Bitch. And Boise has the same vibe. Yeah. So. You're not worried about what everyone else is doing and you can kind of do your own thing. It's like a little laboratory. Yeah. Well, I feel like the, the, the artists in Boise probably are like holding like a piece of wood against a dam and they're like, I can't let go. Yeah, yeah. I feel like <laughs> right. I gotta hold it down. Right. <laughs> Mine is way smaller. You can borrow this anytime. Yeah, this spot, we need your big, big boy. Yeah. We don't have a whole lot of DIY venues like this, so it's extra special when we do stuff like this. 
we actually need a lot more all ages venues in Boise, so having spaces like this means a lot. <laughs> Is there anything about what you're filming that's like confusing or you get it? <laughs> well, now is where the real uh, lose your voice after the show happens. Whoa. The merch sales. Oh, my shirt. My shirt. Oh, I want my shirt. Sure. If you don't have like the money from a record label or something, it's all merch. It's, I mean, places will pay you and that's cool, but like, it's that sweet t-shirt dough that really pays the bills. Hey, TT? Yeah? Can you check? I came to see the, the prison band? bitch and oh my God, they're fucking amazing! It feels good to outfit the public in prison bitch mart. I feel like a wet rat. Do you guys want to sign up? Yeah, these bags were full when we started. It's a fucking long ass day, but this is every day. Trying to wind yourself around a 45, 30 minute time slot. That's like you from Eye of the Hurricane. And then everything else is just like kind of working to make that thing oh, happen. Oh yeah, playing the show is like the easiest, <laughs> chillest part. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and then you're like driving in the rain and it's fun. Yeah. It's so fun. I mean, it's, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life is play music. All right. Wherever Teresa is, we hope she finds her way home. <laughs> no way! She's coming home with us. You're gonna be going the right way. Okay. I can take a Sometimes I feel like I'm not even working hard enough. Like, I don't know. But I think it just comes from loving music and just wanting to do music. Sometimes at the expense of like, wanting to be a person. Creative labor is, is labor and matters. Are there any moments when you've ever been like, man, fuck this music thing, I wanna quit? Uh, yeah, you know, I think everyone has those moments. It would be false to, it would, it would just, it would be insincere to say that, that people don't have the moment where they're like, I'm going to quit. Because I think just about every musician has, I'm going to quit moments, days, years, take breaks, whatever. Have you ever thought about quitting music? I would like to say no to thinking about quitting music. But honestly, in the last two weeks, I have thought about it because life is expensive. But at the same time, like, this is a passion of mine. And I, I do honestly think that art is just how I express myself. So I think even if I was to, like, pick up a nine to five or, you know, find something else, I still would be doing this. Maybe I just wouldn't be doing it as loudly, but I'm going to do me regardless. Have you ever thought about quitting music? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know. I thought about quitting a lot of stuff. I thought about quitting a lot of stuff. Yeah. But crying into your Taco Bell burrito at three in the morning, a gas station in the middle of nowhere, you like start to rethink your life choices a little bit. Yeah. You're lucky if you can find the Taco Bell burrito at the gas station <laughs> yeah. at three in the morning in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> You've ever thought about quitting? No. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, things like this keep me going. Well, that's why I'm in the lane and in the, the headspace that I'm in because I'm tired of it. Tired of getting shut down, tired of doors closing on me, tired of people not understanding me. Have you ever wanted to quit? I've wanted to take a break, <laughs> for sure, but never wanted to quit. I can't stop. This is not a choice. You don't choose to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like for me, this was supposed to be a a theater project, and I think I was just too chicken shit to be in a band. Have you ever wanted to quit? No, not music. I wanted to quit Rickskitball a few times. <laughs> Not music. Yeah. Rig skitball. Rig skitball. Rig skitball. Yeah, you this is this. the rig here. It's my daily driver. Now, there's a Portland musician who goes by the name of Bim Ditson. Bim Ditson. Bim Ditson. Bim Ditson. <laughs> Bim Ditson. Bim Ditson. <laughs> Would Bim Ditson look in this camera if you were here? All right, guys. Basically, rig skitball is built to like have a place where bands can hang out that's not in a dark bar where everybody's drinking. Let's go, baby. 
I feel like if you get really sweaty playing basketball with somebody, you know if you're friends or not, you know? So it's sort of a good environment to like build communities between bands that normally wouldn't know each other. You were in shades? Should I wear shades? Oh, he's a prescription. For me, that's the coolest thing that can happen. It just gives bands that are in community a reason to interact more. And I think that that's what makes the music community good. It's just a new experience, you know, that's when we can create that. That's like really fun. Rig, skit, ball. <laughs> I couldn't tell you when built this bill song. Uh, I played basketball with Doug though, the lead singer. He's uh, real nice. Buckets Doug. He's just like a dude who hangs out and comes to shows and you can see him around town all the time. I like to go to shows and see bands and yeah, I, I love going out and seeing music and, and most of the bands we tour with are bands that I want to see play every night and that's why they're out on tour with us. I know Doug decently well. We were sharing a rehearsal space for a while, actually. And yeah, those first few Tree Force where they were just like ripping shows every night out, some of those shows were insane. I think the coolest thing that John and I were talking about while we were watching is there was like 13-year-old kid, 19-year-old kid, 40-year-old kid. They were all like singing the words. That's cool, that's fucking cool. Doug is just one of those people that he just gets that what people need is just like an opportunity and someone who just goes like, you know, like that's all that people need and it's not that complicated, but it's actually kind of hard to do if you're at his level. Yeah, he really likes to build people up and give them an opportunity. And sometimes that opportunity is just doing a one tour, you know, because that's just a life experience that's really important. Doug is such a down to earth guy, you know, and he's really easy to connect to. And um, he's just a really good collaborator too. And uh, it's an honor to play like all these iconic songs by him. If you want to get to the nuts and bolts of it, if he asks your band to come and open up for him, he pays you enough that you can afford to do it. You know, like that makes a huge difference. Like when, when my band Anna and Ann was touring with them, we got East Coast dates and it was clear that what the offer he sent was enough for us to be able to take off work, drive a van across the country. You know, he thought about what our experience was gonna be and then made it materially possible. And that, like, that's what being like a good dude means. Like, it's not just words, it's deeds, you know, and, and Doug does the deeds, you know. It's changed our lives making friends with Doug. We saw him, we met him at the first tree fort we ever came to, and we were like, we're gonna meet him, and Lila was like, hey, can we open for you? And he was like, okay. This is my buddy, <laughs> Tyler. I met Tyler on tour with Bill to Spill and another band called And And And. That's Doug, that's Cynthia. They're our friends, that's an L. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's, that's a fun part too about playing with different people or, or going on tour with opening bands that haven't you know, been out on tour a bunch or whatever. Cause you kind of feed off of their energy and excitement, you know? Love Lemon, we had this like interview thing with Doug from Built to Spill and we were talking about it, it was like, Doug, what did you think? Like, you made it. And he was like, look like a year ago. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I don't remember exactly, it was something like that. And I was like, oh, well, then we're all screwed. <laughs> We're all like pretty close to quitting our day jobs, but yeah. that means you gotta tighten that belt up. <laughs> Do you guys have day jobs when you're home? It, it's hard to keep them, you know? And so it's, it's and that's what, you know, talking about the like difficulties of touring, like going away for, a, you know, one to three to however many months and then coming back um, and having to kind of scramble every time to get a new job or try and hit up the old, people that you used to work for and maybe they, you know, it's just kind of a crap shoot. Victoria, do you work when you're home or no? Um, yes and no. So I work as like a marketing coordinator at a record label. So, but that's a fully remote job. So I'm like working on tour too. I think like everyone has kind of their own measuring stick for made it, you know, like. Yeah, what's, what's yours? If I did not have to work a day job, and I made the same amount of money I make now, that would be amazing. I think that's my same thing, but it also sucks that you have to associate your art with money, right? Of course. Do you make money off music? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, you just gotta know how to make your situation work for you. 
But the Spotify send me checks? Absolutely not. Unless like you got a song that go viral and you blow up, you're not really making no money from this starting out. You know, it's really an investment. So anybody that's like getting into it, working class, or you know, just starting out, like they're taking a risk. Do you make money making music? No. Well, yes, but it doesn't equate to the amount of money that I put into it. I'm down, I'm down bad as far as making music, making money from music goes. Yeah. It's all right though. It's not about the money. It's never been about the money. I think like, I don't know, I, I make jewelry for a living. I, I don't rely on music for my income. But it'd be nice to do that, I don't know. It just depends on what you want to do with it. You know, there's a lot of different ways to be in music. And like some people want to do it fully as a career because that proves to them that it's real. And for me, this is what proves it's real. You know, it's like that you're part of something fun. I think success in music is just having a good time. 100%. You know, because if you're not, I don't really understand the point. <laughs> yeah. Like you're so <laughs> certainly hard to make money doing it, you yeah, know, not, so if you're having a good time and if, if you're treating people right, you know, that's what it's all about. Ditto. I have never been able to play music full time. If you don't make any money from it, why do you still do it and what motivates you to keep doing it? Ha, uh, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of just like obsessed with it. I know this, it's a journey, so I feel like I'm gonna win at the end of the day. Like, this is just all an investment for me. I'm just playing a long game. It's not about money. Like, who cares about money? It's not about money. It just doesn't fucking matter. It's not part of it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, work, work really hard. Spend a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, Trying to just, like, live. I want to hear about how you protect your creativity. I pray every day. This wasn't planned, but I'm gonna play a song. Uh, from the new record. It's called How to Pray. It's about not knowing how to pray. I just thought, you know, I'll, I'll try to make a little bit of life affirming music. I think everybody hears it likes it. Just want you to know who I am. Don't worry too much what to say. Just don't say you don't know how to pray, pray, pray. I was given a deal, and the deal was bad, but it was better than my bad situation. Played Union Pool, sold out. That's huge. And then Baby's All Right on the, on the Friday, the next day, sold out and I made $200. I can make that in the couch. That's disrespectful. That's exploitative. That's wrong. So I, cut, I, I said, I'm not playing anymore. Not playing anymore, not playing anymore this West Coast side. I got the, I got the recording of the Union Pool show. It was a real nice recording. Made it a live record, dedicated to them. So I can't be fussy. And, uh, and, and sold the live record. You know what I mean? Made, money, made more money off that than I would have made on the tour. And I'm just trying to, like, you know, eat, you know? I'm trying to see my son. I'm trying to live. So many of our art artists don't have, like, actual literal, like, industry representation, and it's just important to us to help give them a foundation to build from and to build community around. We sold out babies of the Squirrel Flower Tour and made quadruple at least what you made, so. Yeah. So I'm really glad you like, were like, fuck this, like I'm done, you know? Uh, there's no manager, agent, PR, I've just said, I call the shots and it has its disabilities, but it also has its merits. And one of the merits is the ability to just say, yeah, screw it, yeah. I'm not doing it. Um. So like for me, I don't necessarily have like a manager professionally, I've kind of been able to just kind of like put people around me who believe in me, who have like these certain skill sets, who 
are financially okay to like put in an extra hour or two after their day to help me out. So like, for example, I got a homie I went to high school with, we played football together, designs my merch, or even like my producer I met, you know, at University of Missouri, like he was just helping me out, trying to find my major and we both, you know, did music. I don't have them on a payroll. You know, they're just doing it because they believe in me and I believe in me and they see that. So, you know, we in it for the long run. We really want to help create connecting points for folks so that they can start building a sustainable career. So maybe it's right to say there's three parts to the music game. Making good music, obviously, building a supportive team, and getting a chance to be discovered. These guys are good about giving people a shot. You know, I think ultimately when it comes down to it, what makes bands, you know, capable of like hitting their next level is experience. And the rest of it is a bunch of talk. So if you can give artists a chance to do their thing in a larger setting, and not abuse them while you're doing that, that's great. We are kind of like dubbed the Festival of Discovery because it is like these acts that are coming up. I mean, we saw Lizzo in 2017, she wasn't even headlining. And now she's like on the cover of Yule Magazine. <laughs> you know what time it is! The Grammy goes to Lizzo for About Damn Time. 2017, you were sort of underground at that time, and since then you've become one of the biggest stars in the world. And people always say, oh, you're an overnight sensation. Well, it, I mean, it takes 10 years to be an overnight success, period. So, you know, I was always gonna be a career musician. I just didn't know I was gonna be the, yeah. yeah. You didn't know you were gonna be <laughs> the star. Well, I didn't know, but can't nobody predict that yes. That's, you know, that's in God's name. Some graphic design nerds always make fun of our poster because of all the tiny little words, and you know you can't read it. Like, hey, you sure you can't? He's got to zoom in. We're really passionate about like that. Every artist matters. We want to elevate them as best that we can, and then we just want to take care of them. We have been touring bands. We played other festivals, and we know what it's like to go to a festival. You feel anonymous to an extent. It's like, is anybody going to make up to our set or? Does anyone even care that we're here? Like, what is the point? Is it just that we get to say we did it, you know? I'll tell you what, Eric Gilbert listens to every fucking band. Like, it's insane. <laughs> he talked to me about my, my music for a minute, and we had, like, a nice chat. Yeah. And I didn't think he was lying to me. No. You know? Like, he I, listens I, I, to I everything. Yeah, yeah. Like, it is, Super it's nice. not performative. It is all authentic. It's, like, one of the few, you know, discovery festivals that still uh, isn't about cryptocurrency you know like you can it's, it's still about music which is cool compared to festivals of this model we're actually very very artist friendly both in pay and like um, we put a lot of them up and they get access to a lot of free food and drinks and stuff mm -hmm. so. he's been in a touring band for years and he was like I've been to those like artist lounges where there's like Cheetos in a bucket like every band that's playing is getting paid which is not true at every festival and it may not be a lot of money, but everyone who's playing is getting a five-day wristband. And they're getting paid. And they have access to the artist lounge. And, um, you know, the idea is that they're having a good experience when they're, they're playing. South by Southwest's revenue is estimated at $142.3 million. For at least a decade, South by has offered its showcasing artists the same unjust compensation options, either take a wristband to attend the festival or receive a one-time payment of $250 or $100 for solo artists. And that doesn't even count the $55 application fee. How can you play the festival and not be given the freedom to, like, attend it? I love the South by. I just played there and I'm coming back to do this, and it's like a corporate entity that you're coming out of this very locally owned entity. And I mean, maybe I'm a little biased because we know every single person who puts on Tree Fort, and we have so much love for every single person who puts on Tree Fort and what they've done for our community here musically. I think that South by Southwest is more of an industry festival as opposed to a, a end user festival. So that's one thing that I think from the beginning is just different. Part of the way that like, that music works as an industry is that you're expected to pay dues and find opportunities where you can and there's something to that to like do some some sorting and that's what south by does it's a kind of brutal sorting method and tree is cool because it i think achieves the same result with a little bit less of a meat grinder for the bands to have to go through like south by is just so saturated there's like thousands of bands and it costs so much to go yeah it feels like going to a corporate convention 
Whereas like, like before it feels like going to a music festival to see music. We went to South by and um, every artist lounge was basically a commercial for Bud Light or, or some kind of branding behind us. There are definitely corporate sponsors all over the place of South by. It's, it's a different festival, you know? I think South by is really catered for the industry. It's something that's needed. Uh, I think our festival is what we say we are, a festival of discovery. Like we want people to come and stumble into a show and find their new favorite bands. You played South by. Have you been yeah. to like any other festivals or like what was South by compared to this? No, I, I did it. I, that was my first like festival wife and uh, right before right before filming the year and very yeah it is very corporate and um yeah and the bands it you know you're not treated you treated like nothing south by is obviously bigger uh the other thing is is like i played south by twice you definitely can just be a band plan for yourself at south by like that's totally possible at south by it was paying a lot of money to be seen by not very many people because it's just inundated. They have larger artists to deal with at South by Southwest than some of the smaller ones. And it's something I notice here at Tree Fort is like, whether you're the headliner, or you're the, you know, you're playing at 11 o'clock, like outside of a coffee shop, they're gonna give you some love. Every artist is really treated the same, essentially. I mean, obviously our headliners have bigger writers. Our headliners and most of our artists are like, they're popular amongst the artist community and they're people that they look up to. And that's more important to us than who's gonna sell the most the most tickets. The bands that come and the artists that come to play Tree Fort, they're the ones that are like our marketing. You know, it's like, it's very organic. We always say at Tree Fort where the bands are fans and the fans are bands. We curate our festival more for the artists than for the casual attendee. And that's all well and good, but at the end of the day, it's still 500 bands which begs the question. How do you pay for all this? We really feel like we've developed a program where the most successful sponsors, they have a meaningful involvement in the festival, as opposed to just, um, you know, like I said, putting a banner on it. We, we do you feel look like at their corporate practices when you decide whether you want them associated with yeah, your name? Yeah, as best we can. Yeah, we, we do say no to people that have won to sponsor and talk to other festivals and they're just like, will you say no to people that want to sponsor you? Like, yeah. So just so you know, we do vet. I mean, it's really important to us that they align. It's yeah. one of those things, like, it's just not corporate. We don't have like, our main stage is called main stage. <laughs> just main stage. That's it. We're not owned by this like bigger entity, right. you know? Like, it's just us. And it is about, you know, who do we want to partner with? Not like what's, it isn't about somebody just writing at it. Oh, Chad, like... Everyone pitches in a little bit. So instead of taking a lot of money from one entity, which would be easier, so props to our sponsorship team who are willing to do the hard work to like work with a lot of different sponsors at smaller levels and make it more meaningful. You know, if we break even, like, we're doing good. You know, but when we, we are in the black at all, it's like, true for a miracle, so... Like cash flow has been an issue, but it's never, we've always like either broke even or made like $500. It's <laughs> not an exaggeration. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> we pay every single band mm -hmm. and we've tried to get the people that work on the festival on a year round basis up to a livable wage. But the things we haven't grown are things like our artist budget is super thrifty when you think about the fact that a lot of bigger festivals will spend on one band what we will spend on everything none of us got into this go play a bunch of stages with all these brands that we're not necessarily naturally aligned with i'm not anti-corporate in general it's not but there is just i just think that that has to be on our terms if the sponsor has if they understand our our values and they um, share those values, we're going to have a good long-term relationship and they're going to make the festival better by being a part of it. If a big corporation came and offered up the bag, would you grab the bag? No. That's something we've talked about in, in internally. Um, is there a price? But I, no, I mean, that's it. That's I, I feel like we would be breaking a promise to our community at, at, at that point. And none of us started this because it was a way to cash out. That, did, that would seem like we, we've 
failed at that point, to be honest with you. So if it did pivot to where we're just trying to make as much money as possible and it, and it started losing some of those edges, I would hope we'd choose to stop it. I wish we could pay bands more. I wish there was like more for the industry, you know? Um, people want to consume music for free. If we convert all listeners to subscribers, streaming can be the future and it could begin to pay better. People want free music but it's not free to make music. A lot of arts funders want to help an artist build a website and all this stuff. Like, artists don't need help with that shit. They need money. <laughs> People have no idea what goes into writing a song and recording a song and going out and performing. It's like years and years of hard work, sacrifice, <laughs> yeah. I have homies like, hey bro, like when the next song dropping, like where you at? Like you ain't been outside, woo woo woo. And I'm like, bro, mixing and mastering costs this much. If I want to run ads, it's going to be like this. The cover art is going to cost this much. If I want to do a video, that's a whole... Once I list out all these expenses, they kind of just like, man, like, bro, you really believe in yourself? I have this like blind confidence that I'm going to be all right and I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to do what I got to do, you know? And maybe that's at the fault of me, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to put in that work. Being on stage can be like super fun as long as you like acknowledge that a bunch of people just pay like 15 bucks to like watch you perform and that's how they're like spending their evening and money. Like when I go out and see a show in New York, like if I'm paying 10 to 15 dollars at the door and buying three drinks, like I want to have like a lot of fun. The thing is just that art is in a container, you know, and like because we live in a world where there's money, art exists in that container. So you have like it's going to operate that way, you know, so yeah, there's no reason to try and we don't have to separate stuff too. It's kind of squishy. It's cool. Whatever. Like I can be an anti-capitalist that sells you a t-shirt. You are. <laughs> I am. <laughs> can you do it for a career? Can you make a living from it? Can you like does that now give you the budget to go on tour, you know? Usually the only way that we can travel to go to music festivals is if we're playing, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. You want to be able to get home and like hopefully pay people for their time. Um, I mean, obviously, like if you think about just going away to spend most of your time in a moving van with a few other people away from like your home or, you know, a lot of your friends and family and pets and all that, you know, that's, that's hard when you're talking about six months every year, things like that, you know. Do you have more experience than I have, you know, touring and everything like that, so. Honestly, I don't feel like it. Like, I feel like I remember you talking about it too. Like, this is being like your first real, like, long stretch of tours, the first tours been ever. The only one, I've, yeah. I've been on, I've been on like two ones like you, right? Yeah. How long will you have been on tour total? Three and a half months. The longest tour I've ever done before that was three weeks long. And even once I'm home, I have less than two weeks off and then I'm back out for another three weeks. We never toured an insane amount. We never toured six months a year, nine months a year, like bands do just trying to like, you know, just like break in or, you know, whatever, just being warriors to try to advance our career. Over the years, we played a lot of shows, but. We just never killed ourselves with it. So it's still kind of fun, you know, it's still a little bit of an adventure, you know. And of course, you know, after that long, it's not quite as fun. You know, nothing's as fun as it was when you were a teenager. Our last tour in Colorado, um, the opening band for Squirrel Flower got in a really bad car accident, like a semi hit them on the highway, pushed them across the highway and then hit them again. And like they had to pull out. And this was like after, um, a different band that was opening the February like also got in a car accident and I got in a car accident going on tour in November so it's a lot of anxiety about just like what that'll look like and how sustainable it is um physically mentally emotionally yeah we are exerting a ton of energy so there's been times where I'll be going 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 and then I'll just be absolutely burnt out and I'll probably take a couple weeks maybe even a month off there's a lot of things about like you getting to do the thing you like to do, but it's not as easy as you thought it was. In underground music, you have to be a good person because you don't have somewhere to stay if you're a jerk. You know, <laughs> like it's like you're not, you don't have enough money to be separate from the world that you're a part of. I loved touring and I love playing music and, and I, I, I don't regret a thing. And for those that have done it and that are, do it, I, th I think it's such an important rite of passage for people. It's such a great way to like 
better understand the country, better understand yourself, better understand uh, your fellow humans. Um, and it doesn't mean we all have to be professional musicians for the rest of our time. But I mean, let's be honest, for a lot of musicians, that is the goal, become a career musician. Have people line up to come see you play. It's a hustle, but it's sure. the most gratifying hustle ever. Got a little lean over the last couple of years. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. You know, that was a, Picking up again though, so that's good. I mean, you gotta be an entrepreneur when you do it. Generally, if I'm familiar with everything, I, I can program a full light show in maybe like 40 to 50 hours. It's like I built all the costumes myself. Really have to learn how to do a lot, but it also makes it a lot more fun. Your goal is to be like, you know, more of a performance art kind of theater thing. Um, and we kind of get a little bit closer to that with each show and the more resources we can get, but still quite a ways away from mm -hmm. So um, we were just finishing up like a two week run with L1011. We got a hotel just south of Seattle specifically because we thought it'd be safer. I wake up the next morning and the van and the trailer are gone. They don't have any security footage back there. And I mean, that, that was pretty much it, just gone. I mean, we're basically desperate. We had everything taken from us and we had no choice but to do the GoFundMe in order to keep going. And so it's a it's really, really humbling and, and kind of a huge blow to the ego to have to do that. That's been like the biggest positive out of this whole thing is just like the, the, the reassurance and the amount of love that we've received, which is an interesting thing to have such a strong connection with the people um, that are fans of your music. It's like everyone's there. Everyone's very excited to be there. With the swords, by each nice. other. Yeah, you just, you all connect. That was fucking 9.9 .9 out of 10. Their music just kept going. I love going to a show and I don't know the band before I go and then I'm just really impressed and I walk away with a smile on my face. Wait, hold on, let me just show you a photo I took really quick. We don't engage, we don't have any lyrics, we don't talk to people on stage. It's completely silent up there except for the music. And to know like the messages they send that just like letting you know how much your music means to them. I just didn't realize, I think, the impact that it had had on people's lives until this moment. And so it's just, uh, I don't know, it's just love, I guess. Tree Fort, I think, launched this art scene here up like a couple levels. Oh yeah. Because not only was it such a great sense of community and friendship amongst all the locals, but everyone kind of started pushing each other. If I'm gonna say something about the Boise music scene, I would probably say that it's been really cool to see it in a nurturing stage for so long. Bonding! Where? <laughs> Usually music scenes start getting competitive with each other, but this one in the Boise music scene, um, we kind of push each other to do better, push each other to create more. That's one thing that this city, you know, feeds off of. I mean, look how it's been these last few days. You know, it's been the community out here creating, supporting every artist, not just one, not just two, but every artist. I would go to a show and I would go to any show that would happen at the venue. I just wanted to go to shows. And I'd see the same like 30 people there. Like everyone was just going to see shows. And I think the Tree Four came in and saw that and was like, oh, we can grow this community. I love Boise because it's like the hub for the weirdos, you know, it's the hub for the creatives and the musicians, the uh, progressives, you know. Boise doesn't get enough credit for the arts, that's for sure. It's like, we've got a huge crowd. Boise itself 
is a very like blue island in a sea of red. Yeah, it's like a purple dot in the midst of a red state. I love Boise. Boise is my home. Um, Idaho legislature, though, sucks. It's hard being in a predominantly Republican state. Um, extremely conservative, and sometimes it's really hard to live here because of that. We had a professor at BSU, like a prolific professor, like, stay publicly that women don't belong in STEM. Every effort must be, must be made not to recruit women into engineering, but rather to recruit and demand more of men who become engineers. Ditto for med school and the law and every trade. Thank you. Idaho is now the first state to pass a bill modeled after the Texas law banning abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. The highest court in the state upheld three separate restrictive abortion laws. The Idaho House forwarded a bill today that would ban health care providers from providing gender affirming medical care to minors with gender dysphoria. Activists demanding that the library ban more than 400 books. Some Idaho lawmakers are now looking into adding criminal charges for anyone who administers an mRNA vaccine like a COVID or flu shot. If you don't like your mayor, vote that motherfucker out. If you don't like your city councilman, run against that motherfucker. And if all else fails, burn this motherfucker to the ground. They're making choices for women, and they have no female, like, anything. And they're making policy that is hurting young women and young people in the state. Crazy political environments and all that stuff, like if you just step out of it a little bit, what you see is that it produces like a need for culture that being comfortable doesn't produce. Class war now! Class war now! Like the worse it gets, the better the art gets, so that's just how it goes, you know? Like you don't have art in Utopia. The festival itself, I don't feel like is political, but the people that run it, we have our feelings, strong feelings about what's right and wrong and about issues. But we, like we said, Tree Fort is for everybody, not just for the people that agree with us. And we try to encourage collaboration of all kinds, and that's across genre, that's across different disciplines, and it's also across party lines and position lines. I get out the airplane, I hop in the Uber, and I'm just kind of getting the vibe. So I asked my Uber, like, hey, bro, am I good? Like, am I safe? He was like, bro, you good? Like, stay in the city, stay around Tree Fort festivities. Like, we all RT, we're here to have a good time. Generally, like, I don't think this is necessarily more or less racist than, like, another place. Um, it's unsafe in a lot of places, everywhere, for a lot of different reasons. I live in Wyoming, which is also a red state and has been forever, and Iowa is relatively red. It's like all of these things that like you think matter, but it's just like, you know, it's everywhere all the time, you know? There is one you no know, type of music, one vibe out here, and that's what I love about what I do, is I bring my own mix and my own spin on things. As a DJ, it's my job, our job, to introduce people to new music. Tree Ford is bringing in like some like people from all over and having a diverse, inclusive community. And like we're trying to like keep that here, not just during the festival, but like throughout the year. Tree Ford tries, they're, they're doing it, but like I think it's got a long way to go. But I think it's off to a fucking excellent start. And the more people know about it, the more they're chill and coming out. Like it's a. It's a good, it's a good, lots of good spaces. I definitely feel like it could be more uh, black rappers and black musicians at Tree Fort. But at the same time, when I think about it from their perspective, I'm like, does that make sense? Like, is there really a crowd for that? In Boise, there's not really a lot of black people in Boise anyway. I mean, overall, I would say they did a good job. They had me there. So, you know, we did what we could. But yeah, definitely something to work on. I, I truly feel like we're at the cultural frontier here. Like we have a real opportunity to make a difference here, and I just believe strongly in cultural diplomacy, and that can happen both locally at a state level 
definitely is a powerful thing I internationally. It's, it's a way we can bridge things, but I also think for us, Treefort has always been a aspirational e event. And when you talk about, you know, the creative class, but also just diversity in general and showing just like softening the edges around some of these conversations. Us as artists, if we can come together and just realize the power that we have to speak through music and really, you know, get the community to understand different cultures, different sounds, different arts, we could definitely make a big change. We just have to come down as a collective and know the impact that we have on it as a community. Cause I mean, we could treat for it. Like how many people you can influence in a week. Any city that does it citywide is gonna like have people who go finally and have people who go like, we don't like that, you know? So none of that matters. What matters is just like, if artists have a space to do their thing, then good stuff comes out of it because art's got power. Boise is at this, it's still a growing city. We feel like we can impact it. And a lot of people that are here are excited about that. There's an opportunity to make a difference in a city that hasn't fully defined itself yet. I still think it's salvageable. <laughs> so. You know, we love Boise and we feel like these bands would love Boise and we wanted the artists to discover that and come play here, but we also wanted the people that are here to not feel like they have to move to another city to do what they want to do, whether it be be in a band or make films or um, be in creative writing. It's about loving what you do and getting to do that here as opposed to feeling like you have to go somewhere else to do those things. When you live in Boise and you grow up in Boise, you want to get out of it because it's kind of a small town. So there's a few places people go and most, most of them go to Seattle. To be honest with you, in the beginning of 2011, I was like, we were on a label out of Portland. I wasn't convinced Boise was the kind of place I wanted to be or could stay or would offer the things I would want out, out of it. But in 2011, we were like, let's really try it on. And there was a lot of cool stuff happening at the time. Radio Boise got started. A Youth Lagoon was rising up at that time. It's in the summer of 2011, we started Tree Force, started working on it. Um, and so I guess I gave, I gave it a chance and it hasn't convinced me to move yet, so. You moved to Boise and you actually, I, for the first time felt like I could make this place what I think it could be based on maybe the seed that I'm gonna find in myself someday. Every music scene has, I don't know, like folks who wanna seek something else, you know? And there's a lot of folks who would go to Portland or Seattle or LA, you know? I used to say to folks that wanna to move to Portland if, if several years ago, I was like, but the river's clean here. Stay here and help us keep the river clean. You know, no offense to my Portland friends, but we can eat the fish out of our out of our river still. And so, and if if we all leave, that care about that, that 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 could change. We don't all necessarily agree politically, but leaving isn't the answer to solving a problem. There was times like you know, seven years ago, I was like, I'll go to LA and just give it a shot, just see if I can make it, you know, or whatever. Up until recently, also cost of living was a huge thing. To be a touring musician is not the easiest thing in the world on your pocket, so it's like nice to be here. But then on top of that, I think I'm just trying to grow with the community and not leave them here just because it's not giving you what you need. Like there's a million of me over there and there's like 30 of me here and the 30 of us here can really build something beautiful together. Would you move to New York or LA or like a bigger city? I've thought about it. Um, I've tried it. I dip my toes in. Uh, but to be honest, like bigger cities, I honestly feel a little lonely. I feel like you're surrounded by so many people, mm -hmm. but yet you can just be obsolete in that. Or feel obsolete, maybe. Yeah. And yeah. where in Boise, I feel like I. I can be like, hey, I need my friends, help. <laughs> yeah, and they just yeah, yeah. literally show up in five minutes. I don't want to live in a town like Boise or a small town because I have this like fear that once you feel like successful in your small community like that, that like maybe you would like turn off a bit and like stop working hard. I think if I wasn't living in New York, I don't know if I'd feel that like motivation, you know? I feel like there's this underlying like notion that to make it big you eventually got to move to LA or to New York and I had this mindset going in a tree fort and I was meeting some bands that was like from Boise doing tree fort and I'm like just kind of curious looking at my like back in my mind like what do they get from doing this you know but I get it it's like this day city they got to build it up like this how they got so more power to them. I, one of the maybe the greatest successes of tree fort is it is at least locally and it's such an amplification of the creative class that it that that it is really translated to the business community and the city and the state 
the value that we bring to a local ecosystem. It's probably more people here that are either playing in a band, they're a speaker, or they've been a volunteer, or they somehow are working on this festival. Everywhere you go, I would say that's at least 60-70% of the crowd, so thanks for taking care of each other. Thanks for being awesome. We're kind of an anchor point for a lot of gig workers uh, throughout the year that do a lot of different creative things from photography, graphic design, art in general, and um, I think this sort of hub that we've created for that locally helps strengthen the creative class here in Boise. I came from Denver originally, it's like almost 20 years ago now. And I, I was only supposed to be here for a summer. And here it is 20 years later and I'm still here like, I've hated jobs, but this is the best job I've probably ever had in my life. Like a lot of the food trucks that have come over the years like have been able to go on and build their businesses just from like the week of tree four, you know, it's, it's, it has such a positive impact in a variety of ways, like culturally, socially, financially on the community. I work at the Neurolox. I've worked here for uh, a little over three years. Uh, this particular tree four uh, has been pretty lucrative, which is nice. I work a seven hour shift. And, um, uh, you know, I paid my rent in two days, so you know, that's all right. The creative class, music, art, we, we have value to the business community. And what's cool is that both our city, our state, a lot of the business community here has recognized that. I think one, it puts us on the map a little bit more. So obviously that's chill. Two, it brings in a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, you got heads and beds. So people are spending money here. They're getting hotel rooms. No matter what draws you to Tree Fort, businesses say they love having the music festival in town. Hotels in the area say they're completely booked this weekend. Half of the hotel is our musicians that come in for Tree Fort. So they they come in daily and the other half is full of people who just want to be downtown for, for Tree Fort. They want to be in the middle of the action. Whenever you like say you work in the music industry, everybody's like, oh, you just have fun all the time. This is a job. Like this is what people do and we're actually supporting other people's jobs. It isn't just like, oh, this is so five days and we're coming to fun. It's like, this is our lives, you know, like. It's one of those things like, yes, I can get another corporate marketing job and make six figures, but like, is that going to make me happy? Probably not. It is my family. My husband is the festival director. Like, this is a year-round job for him. It's my husband's livelihood. So my mom and stepdad were just here, and it was really fun to see them, like, witness Tree Fort. Like, they walked up, and they were like, wait, what? <laughs> like, all of this? I'm like, Oh yeah, this is just the beginning. This is just one block of it. <laughs> that was a very proud moment. There's not a whole lot of multi-venue city festivals anymore in the U.S. And I don't know why. Maybe they're not successful. <laughs> but I hope we continue the success of what we've created. There may be a time where Tree Fort runs its course and it no longer makes sense. I like to believe that that's probably got at least another 10 years on it. To be honest with you, we're not, it may sound weird, but we don't look that far into the, into the future. It was really like, let's do one festival. And it's been like from there on. And our mantra internally has always been like sus sustainability and maintaining the initial spirit of the festival. I felt so special that first year. And so for us, it's as long as we continue building the strength of the creative class here, you know, as long as there's, it, it makes sense. Success is like a legacy. I really want Tree Fort to live on. Like, I don't know, I'm I think it's a, probably the biggest part about growth, right? It's just hard. And, but it's, it's so worth it, you know? That's probably, I mean, the proudest moment of Tree Fort is probably just watching bands feel excited and feel wanted and feel like accepted. I get to like empower other people to do cool shit. <laughs> Here's my thought to it. It kind of goes back to the forts a little bit. Is like people spend a lot of times in their silos. You know, we get stuck in their silos. 
and that leads to a lot of the division that we face. And like, I think one of the beautiful things about Treefort is that collaborative spirit, but you get people that may only listen to country music, and we have some country artists, so they come down and then they stumble upon a bluegrass artist, and then they stumble upon a funk band, and then start breaking down some of those silos that we get stuck in. So I think our role in that is a little bit more indirect, but I think a big part we take seriously is helping break down some of those barriers. Music is a lifetime sport. Like it's just such a, a community focused experience if you enter it through that vantage point. So for me, like Treefort is really built from, it's like a DIY festival that it has figured out how to like present itself, like wear, wear a suit every once in a while. We're community run, we're independently owned and yeah, no sellouts, bitch. <laughs>